I don't know, uh, my name is Amy Pettit. I'm the Executive Director of Alaska Farmland Trust. We won't spend too much time on that, but our mission is the permanent protection of Alaska's agricultural soils. I say farms, what's your superpower? Um, this is a real thing. We just closed on another 63 acres of beautiful Palmer soil uh, last Friday, a week ago yesterday. It was such a um, huge project for us to get that uh, property permanently protected. We'll be farmland forever. So we're now up almost at 400 acres saved, which is incredible. Super, super proud of that. Also last Friday, we submitted an application for our next project, which will be 95 acres of a beautiful farm property in Palmer. So um, the critical work that we're doing, I think in the Farmers Market Coalition slide that Brad showed earlier, you see that nationwide we're losing over an acre of farmland every single day. Here in the, um, in the Matsu Valley, we are losing so much valuable farm ground. People have this mindset that Alaska's huge, Alaska is mostly state and federal lands. Why should we lock up more private land in this way? But not all soil is created equal and not all soil is um, valuable for agricultural production in the same way. So that's why we're here, that's what we're doing. I'm gonna share these graphics again because I think, um, I don't know if Sarah Dillon Jensen is still on, but you've gotta see something at least six times before you believe it, right? That's a marketing thing. So again, Alaska is leading the nation in the number of new farms. 46% of Alaska farmers have less than 10 years of farming experience and we're leading the nation. Why? I'd love to see a discussion in the chat box about why you think that is happening. Why are we leading the nation in the number of new farmers? Super curious to see your feedback on that. The number of farms grew nationwide. There was a 3% decrease in the number of farms from 2000 seven to 2012, right? That's that's the five, no, 2012 to 2017. That was the last ag census. So nationwide, 3% decrease in Alaska, 30% increase. We all know that um, these numbers are low, but this is a very powerful statistic. We more than doubled the amount of money that's sold directly from farmers to consumers. And um, I know a particular farmer's market whose manager is watching right now that sells a lot of the a lot of this value is sold at his market and we we kind of concur that that's that 4.5 million is low statewide so we're proud of that we want to promote that we want and and this is why it's so important that farmers markets are kept open this summer so that our farmers have access to those consumers we're so glad to um, have had the lieutenant governor on the call yesterday to see such quick action between them and DEC to get farmers markets listed as essential and this this is why right Small but mighty, um, the number of small farms is up 73% across the state. We all know that it doesn't take a lot of space to grow good food. Um, we're, we're proud of that too. I think this, there's been a shift in the idea of what a farm is in Alaska. It doesn't have to be a thousand acres, doesn't have to be 400 acres. It can be a small, you know, less than 10 acre plot. And we're all super proud of this one. 47% of Alaska farmers are women leading the nation, almost double the national average. A lot of discussion about why that number is the way that it is too. But um, my answer is, I think that it's just part of the nationwide trend of, of women taking over a lot of roles, right? We've got women in leadership positions. We've got, we've got women, women taking over small businesses, um, taking over the world. And, and I think we're all okay with that, right? Um, I really quickly wanna give a shout out Shout out to myself. Um, is that possible? <laughs> I do have a weekly radio program called Ag Matters, where I cover positive Alaska agriculture stories from across the state. I've been on air, I think, three years um, this Thanksgiving. And um, if there's, there's some businesses that have been highlighted over the last day and a half that I'd really love to have on the show. So if I reach out to you, I promise it's a real painless half hour Q&A about your business. And it just helps spread the positive stories about our industry and get more people engaged in what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and why people should support it. So now let's get into meat at the market. Um, that next slide has way too many uh, words on it for me to leave it on that. So I'll leave it on this instead. I wanted to have a panel about, um, about meat availability and meat being sold at the farmer's market. And I had some great panelists in mind when we were gonna be all in the same room together. Things change when you're, when you're using this Zoom platform. P some people aren't as comfortable being on screen and, and I totally get that. I'm not comfortable either, uh, but here we are. And so I, I've talked to a couple of people, like I said, Rochelle Plummer is gonna um, unmute herself and answer some of these questions. 
And Marissa with AMCC, I think is also gonna answer some questions about fish at the market. And we're just gonna talk about um, what, what products are being sold at markets now, what products we should try and get sold at farmers markets, but let's keep this all in mind that this was in the world pre-COVID and how things, um, how things end up at the markets this year is a little bit unknown, but hopefully we will have meat available at the market and, um, and folks selling in that way. So these were the questions that I asked um, in addition to Rochelle and Marissa, I asked a couple of other uh, folks that aren't involved in the call today, but sent me some of their answers and we'll take these kind of one at a time. So what is the biggest hurdle to selling meat at the market? And Rochelle, if you want to jump on and unmute yourself first and just talk about your experience when you were at the farmer's market physically with your product, um, what, was your, what was your biggest hurdle to selling fresh meat at the farmer's market? Um, I only sell at one farmer's market because I had trouble getting into other farmer's markets. Okay. Um, because of um, the way my business works, um, I don't personally produce enough meat to sell at a farmer's market, but I own the co-op. So some farmer's markets, um, they have rules against people um, brokering or distributing or, you know, and so that has kept me out of some of them, which is unfortunate because um, as a small producer, you may not have enough inventory to put out the time commitment or the financial commitment to sit at this farmer's market for hours. Um, or, you know, um, it, the way you farm just doesn't allow for you to put, you know, to be out there um, working with your customers. So there's... Um, a lot of different little facets there that um, are hurdles of at why you don't see a lot of meat at farmers markets. Okay, great. And Marissa, did you want to add to that from the fish perspective? Um, yeah, just I guess a quick disclaimer. Um, our program, Catch 49, operates primarily out of a brick and mortar distribution center in Anchorage, and we've only dabbled in um, selling at market. I believe only at the, the Harvest Moon Festival in Soldatna. So our experience with this is limited, but I still think that there is some overlap there that's relevant. Um, again, I would, I would probably echo that, that you know, having mostly a, a frozen product is one of the biggest challenges in terms of logistics. You know, we need a self-contained power source, um, have to be able to you know, keep our product frozen and, and plugged in for, for hours. Um, and also educating consumers that, that were there and to expect to, um, you know, be prepared to transport a frozen product home. Right, right, perfect. Okay, um, a couple of the other answers that I got from folks that aren't on the call with us today um, was often when you're selling meat, you know, uh, we're all familiar that, with this, but you know, you break down one beef cow, you only have so many steaks and so many high value cuts, and then you end up with a lot of burger, right? And of course, when you're at the market, everybody wants the T-bone, everybody wants the loin, everybody wants the high value cuts, and you end up left, you know, with a bunch of leftover products. So that was one of the um, things that somebody else mentioned to me. And then um, the, other, the other thing that was mentioned too was just the, the product itself. You're dealing with a frozen product and everybody else is hoping for the beautiful hot sunny day in the middle of summer and, and you're kind of wishing that it was cloudy and overcast so it was easier to keep your product cold. Um, next question, what is the biggest benefit to selling meat at the market? Rochelle, what, what, was your, what were your high points when you were selling? Um, we get to educate the consumers on what is grown in Alaska directly. Um, a lot of times people get hung up on Alaska not being able to grow anything. And really, um, there's very few things that, um, staple things that we can't grow. So educating our consumer is, is um, that would be one of the biggest benefits. Um, and um, farmer's markets, the one I work with, it's um, four hours, great traffic flow, um, extremely quick sales and you're done and you're back on the road and um, that's what I love about farmers markets. Okay, I'll go ahead Marissa. Um, yeah, I would echo Rochelle certainly in the opportunity to educate the public about you know our, our presence and, and our, our role in the larger food system. 
Um, I would also add that there's, there's a benefit to us in that we're capturing an increased profit margin by doing direct to consumer sales. And in the case of our program, Catch 49, um, all of our profits go back to um, the nonprofit that houses it all, which is the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. And we invest that further in conservation efforts to promote the sustainability of the fisheries. So um, we're, we're able to realize a higher um, a return of uh, just a, a wide breadth of benefit that's you know economic as well as social. Yeah. And um, from our from our non participants that provided me some information, I heard that um, on the flip side to the previous answer, you know, everybody always wants the primal cuts and and they're left over with a bunch of uh, ground burger at the end of the day. But what he also mentioned was that um, when they came to the table and they wanted that primal cut and it wasn't available, he was able to say, well, how are you planning to use that? And then kind of educate them on a different cut of beef or a different cut of pork that, you know, you really can cook in the same way and can be enjoyed in the same way. And so that customer education that can take place at the farmer's market that you really can't do as easily in an online platform or if you were just um, offloading your product to a grocery store. He also talked about, um, educating the customers oh and that obviously just the whole reason any of us want to go into the farmers market is that ability to look our producer in the eye ask them direct questions about their product how the animal was raised etc and have that feel-good relationship about man this guy really cares about his his animals he was taking care of them in a in a way that meets my values and my standards and you can and they the customers really appreciate that face-to-face -face level what is the most common question you received from potential shoppers about your products? So when people approached you at the booth, um, what was the most common question that you got asked? Go ahead, Rochelle. Um, free range, grass fed and non-GMO. Okay. And uh, above and beyond always, every time it's, you know, so thankfully we got our website up and, you know, maybe that'll curb some of the questions a little bit. Right, right. Do you want to take a, a second at all to address those, to address your products and those three things? Um, well, uh, Alaska, on the meat side, the, um, all of our products are always um, free range. We don't, um, we don't really have the um, confined feeding operations. We don't have um, the huge poultry houses that people see um, in the media. We just, you know, the infrastructure isn't there, and um, most, if it ever happens, most of my customers would be happy if it never happened. You know, they're looking for a small farm, um, quality, clean food. So um, grass-fed, everything's grass-fed. Some now, even in the winter, we have a farm that's doing um, a huge fodder system. So um, there's a lot of farmers out there that are stepping up their game and producing a grass-fed year-round product, which um, for my clean foodies is very important to them. And so that's, um, that's really, uh, you know, that's the key. Um, especially the market is growing in that direction. So uh, the more we can do of uh, growing our food as clean as possible and keeping Alaska as clean as possible, um, I think um, the market's just going to grow. Right. GMO and organic, do you want to address, th address that at all, Rochelle? Um, GMO, uh, I explained to my customers that um, generally speaking, our, our grain growers don't use a GMO product. Um, they use a um, product that is bred to um, grow in Alaska. Um, and so specifically our barley is non-GMO, our wheat is non-GMO. Um, as for the organic, um, I help them understand that Alaska is probably more organic just being Alaska grown than the organic label. Um, I, uh, so, uh, it's just a lot of educating consumers on um, what they think they want. You know, um, a lot of my customers are um, come from organic label, and um, we don't have organic meat in Alaska because there's not. Uh, we don't have like, organic feed stuff. Um, the feed that we do for poultry is imported, and so I try to help my customers um, understand that. 
Um, from my perspective, I would rather use a, a quality locally grown product than something that's shipped in from Washington State or the East Coast. Um, because um, keeping it as local centric as possible is, is um, part of my thing. So um, just educating the consumer and um, helping them understand that Alaska in, it, in itself is clean, you know, very, very clean. Absolutely. Go ahead, Marissa. Um, yeah, again, I, I guess I find myself um, echoing Rochelle's um, comments about education being a, a primary component of those interactions with our customers. Um, now, with Catch 49 and our distribution center, you know, most of our traffic, not all of our traffic, comes from people who already know about us. And so, through a lot of our digital communications, that education component is already built in. Um, but in those instances where we have been at a farmer's market, you know, we get some questions about traceability there um, and also just basic handling questions like how do I, how do I cook this? You know, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with salmon, but like what do I do with black cod? So just kind of some basic, um, basic questions like that, that, you know, fortunately we usually have um, paper materials we can send people home with recipe cards and fun things like that too. Right. Great. And for our, for our non-participants on the call, the, the feedback that I got was one of the number one questions that he got the, the year that he was at market was, um, is this really Alaska grown? And I don't think we have time to, to dive into that in this presentation today, but, um, you know, for Director Shady, if he's still on the call and for other folks, you know, um, when it comes to the Alaska grown standard, I think one of the places where there is still a lot of questions and a lot of opportunity for, um, for discussion is what the Alaska grown standard means for livestock. Some people, you know, believe firmly that that should mean that the animal was born and raised and fed in Alaska 100%. That's not the way the current standard read, or that's not the way it read when I left. I, I should say that I haven't um, gone back and read it recently, but when I left the Division of Ag, it was um, more than 50% of the animal life had been in Alaska. So anyway, that was the number one question that he got is, is the product really Alaska grown? And then that would lead to a discussion about what does that mean for livestock? So maybe another um, topic for the chat box, not for the full presentation. Um, what are the top five must have to selling meat at a farmer's market? Um, pictures of your product, cooling system, signage, what would you say are your top five must haves if you're gonna have a, a meat vendor at your farmer's market or if you're going to be a meat vendor, Rochelle? Um, I went with um, signage um, because our product has to be insulated. So um, I go with a bunch of huge white coolers and um, they have to stay closed. So good, bright signage is um, key. Um, also, the quality of your meat cuts um, and a product that a consumer can recognize. My uh, One of my other questions, uh, you know, is, um, for example, um, a piece of round steak. A round steak is not a product that you normally see in the grocery store anymore. Now, now you don't see it. Back in the day, you did. Um, and people don't know how to um, utilize it. So uh, having products that, or being able to explain to a customer um, how you would, I think you mentioned this earlier, um, use it, what pro you know, recipes you'd use it for. Um, uh, so having products that a consumer recognizes is important. Um, clean, colorful displays, um, clean coolers, you know, um, having everything, um, I'm pretty particular, having everything on point is, um, is always good. Um, levels of pricing, so you reach, or um, groups of packages that you reach every level of consumer um, that comes in there. Um, and um, the ability to educate the consumer on everything you have there available, where it comes from, um, how it's grown, um, specifically how it's grown. Um, and, yeah, that would be it. Okay, great. Marissa? Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think for us having um, nearby, you know, community-based cold storage um, in Anchorage, there's, there's a lot more infrastructure that's available there, but I know that's kind of tougher in more remote communities. 
Um, but that's essential for, you know, having a bigger warehouse, you know, that you can draw from and, and be consistently at these markets. Um, having um, a, a product that's frozen has been helpful for us. It's, it's just easier to deal with in terms of, of permitting and food safety concerns and just ease of handling. Um, reusable bags and other kind of swag and flair like that um, certainly draws people in and um, is a, a nice way to minimize all the, the packaging that certainly comes from dealing with a, a meat product and something that's frozen. Um, and uh, email and a phone number that somebody very responsive and, and cheerful <laughs> is, is replying to for customers to follow up, you know, somebody to take that information home and say, you know, gee, I really like this. I'd like to continue going on or, or to share it with other people. Yeah, good. That's great. Um, the other comments that I got were uh, recipe cards, giving people ways to use the product. Um, concur with Rochelle about different price points. Um, not everybody can, you know, what did the average dollar amount spent was $40, I think, the AFMA girls, um, the interns had discovered. Um, so recognizing that people are coming to the market and they've already spent a fair amount of money or they plan to spend a fair amount of money, so you want to have those price points available for them. Um, pictures of happy animals before they were dispatched was one of the things that the other person said. You know, people like to see the cow in the field. They like to see the hog in, you know, in the field, the chickens, whatever. They like to see that animal, which I've heard conflicting stories on that. Um, you know, some people don't like to think about what the meat was before it, before it was in the, the wrapping. Um, but so I, I, I don't know, but um, for me personally, I, I like to see the pictures of the happy cows and the happy pigs um, first. And then that cooling system, yeah, is obviously super, super important and can be a challenge for meat producers. Um, like Ra Rochelle said, the big white coolers are one thing, but what about the rest of your product that's not out on display? Is it in your truck behind your booth? Is it, you know, does it, if you need a, if you need a lot of product at the market, how are you getting it there? And I, I guess a question for market managers to consider and I don't think that this was addressed at all in the um, in the emergency response or what we know today, but it'll be interesting. You know, some of these booths, I can think of a couple of booths at farmers markets that I've been to that are selling fish and meat products. There's a lot of staff members behind the scenes at those booths. And if we're talking about limiting exposure and limiting the contact between people six feet of distance, et cetera, but you can't really do that behind your booth, right, with your employees. So I just wonder if there'll be any restrictions placed on how many booth workers market booths can have. And, and hopefully not, I guess, because I can picture some of these booths with a lot of people. But anyway, good feedback there on must-haves for selling meat at the market. Um, why should every farmer's market have a meat vendor? And let's switch it up just for these last couple of questions. And Marissa, let's hear your answer first. Why should every farmer's market have a meat or seafood vendor? Oh, yay. Um, well, I'll, I'll certainly, you know, take, take the fish lens with this one. You know, Alaska seafood has been an integral part of every Alaskan's food repertoire since time immemorial, really, up there. It's, it's an essential protein. It's part of our culture and our economy, and it's a reminder for people that Alaska's food systems and its wild harvesters, you know, for us in particular, have been essential and resilient for millennia. Yeah, I, I would echo that, that with Alaska seafood and the amount of money that has been pumped into marketing Alaska seafood, like through ASME, the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, why would you not want to have that be part of your market, right? It's kind of like the reputation of the Alaska Grown program. If you can be an Alaska Grown member, why wouldn't you be? And why wouldn't you showcase that as much as possible? Because it just adds to your marketing, right? And Rochelle, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, um, I would have to um, say that um, meat in general brings in um, customers. Um, you're going to get, um, well, I, I, when I go to a farmer's market, I like to see the biggest variety. Those are the farmer's markets. It's kind of a one-stop shop, you know, um, and so I, I would say meat um, brings in customer flow, and that's, you know, um, 
important. So um, I think every farmer's market should have at least one meat vendor, more, as many meat vendors as you can put in there. Right. The more meat, the better, right? I think it's been interesting. Um, I can't remember which outside presenter it was, but when they were talking about um, diversity of booths at the farmer's market and how um, she would not recommend ju only having one carrot vendor or only having one of this. I think that you're right that multiple meat vendors is a good thing. Um, I have always been an advocate that competition makes us all better. And if you, if there is a competitive booth at the market, that's also offering a similar product to yours, isn't that going to make you strive to do a better job and sell better product and bring better product to the market? Um, one of the things that I forgot to mention in the the previous slide about um, top five must-haves. The gentleman that I spoke to talked about how important it is to not bring product to the market that doesn't look good. Um, that, you know, he had some experiences where he, he got his meat um, from the packaging facility, from the processing facility, and it just didn't look as good as it should. And rather than take that, mar that product to market and sell it that day, he chose to keep it home and sell it in a different way to a customer that was already established, that knew that this was a, a packaging error, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't a quality of product error, but he, you know, forwent those sales or he foregoed, is that a word? Um, those sales at the farmer's market because he didn't want to represent his business in that way with that product. And he stressed the importance of that. Um, you might only get one shot with those um, customers at the farmer's market and you don't want to screw it up by offering a product that's um, not your best and highest quality standard, right? Absolutely. Yep. Um, so what are the requirements to selling meat at the market? So I want to talk about this in two platforms, right? Because we have, um, we have statewide rules that cover all of the farmers markets throughout the state. And then we have the municipality of Anchorage, which can have stricter requirements. They can't have, um, less requirements, but stricter requirements. And to my knowledge, um, correct me if I'm wrong, which I don't know how you do that. Um, cause I can't see the chat box anymore, but I think that those are the only two places where we have, we have statewide rules and we have municipality of Anchorage rules, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Rochelle, you have sold at, um, within markets within the municipality of Anchorage. So do you want to talk about what your requirements were to get your meat at market? Um, for the um, municipality, you needed another permit. Um, for the state, you need a food handler's permit and some other things. For the municipality, you need a city license, but you also need um, a second food handler's permit besides the one the state um, requires. And at the time, that cost me $130 per menu. Okay. So um, that's a limiting factor. Sure, selling at a market, you know. Um, yeah, I was pretty disappointed with that one. Right, and did, was that because you weren't, did that have something to do with the origination of the product, like that you were sometimes selling other people's product, or? No, that had to do with, um, I, it, we fall under um, a food handler's permit. It didn't matter if it, I was operating at a farmer's market or I was operating a food truck. Um, that's how she explained it to me. It was so, Okay. Um, if I had done more than one farmer's market, um, I would have paid that $130 or whatever per, if I had done South Anchorage and Spinard and 15th. And so it can be pretty cost prohibitive if you're, um, to sell, um, meat in Anchorage. $130 per venue. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. That, that would be a limiting factor because above and beyond that, you're going to have to have your, um, your, your spot at the farmer's market that costs you money. Right. And, um, wow. Okay. Interesting. Um, and Marissa, what can you tell us about selling, about selling seafood? And I don't know if you guys, do you sell at all outside the municipality? Um, we, again, our, our model's a little bit different because we're not doing retail on site. We're doing pre-orders and di distri distributing in, in different communities. Right. Um, so I'm certainly, I'm not as knowledgeable as I think Rochelle is in this regard, but I would, I would echo what she said. You know, I think in the municipality, you need a, you know, retail or a temporary food permit, um, you know, proof of, uh, frozen storage and, uh. To, to my knowledge, you know, that's, or that's the extent of my knowledge. 
I guess. But I did want to um, circle back on a, a point of the last question about having multiple meat mark, uh, meat vendors at the market. And I just, I just want to say, I think it's really important to normalize all local food producers and harvesters and to have as many people out there as possible to just help people understand what's available in their local communities. Like, yes, we do have multiple, um, you know, farms that are making chickens around here. And like, this is where you can come and get it and you don't have to go to Safeway. So bring it on. Yeah, perfect. So just to circle back to, um, you know, obviously one of the basics on the meat side of the equation when it comes to red meat, in order to sell red meat um, anywhere in the state, not just at the farmer's market, but um, by individual cuts, it has to have gone through a USDA facility, right? And so just reminding folks of that, that it, um, and that is a limiting factor. Obviously, um, anybody involved in the meat industry will tell you that, um, you know, only having, is it three now certified USDA slaughter? facilities, North Pole, Delta Junction, and Palmer? Is that it? Yes, yes. Um, Delta Junction doesn't cut for retail as, as far as I know, so they only cut for themselves, so that kind of um, yep. takes them out of the game. So really two, and, and sometimes only one, right? Um, there's, there's been some, some issues with the, um, with the meat plants along the way. But anyway, um, if you want to sell product, uh, as individual cuts, it has to have been processed in a USDA facility, limiting factor. Um, however, I do, I do know of a vendor who would go to market, and not with any product, but with pictures of product, and he was selling um, product by the whole and by the half, and um, he didn't attend too many farmer's markets, but he did go and try to uh, just market his, his business of selling whole animals and selling half animals in that way, just kind of to get some name recognition out there. It was a little bit for customers to approach a table and not have any product to purchase, but they, you know, he was then able to engage conversations with folks and talk about how he raises his animals and things like that. So for a producer that's just getting started and hasn't, um, you know, doesn't have enough product to, you know, sell by the piece, by the cut after the USDA slaughter, that I suppose that still would be an option to go to market and just talk about your business and, um, you know, edu again, educating the public about what it's like to buy a whole animal at a time, um, the difference in cost, what it's like to buy a half an animal, um, how, you know, all, all those sorts of factors. But I did want to point out that that, that would be an option as well. Um, those were, that was our official questions that we walked through, that I had everybody walk through. Um, like I said, when I'm in full screen like this, which I guess, suppose I could exit now because um, that's the official part of the, um, of the questions that I asked everybody. I don't know um, if any of our organizers have been watching the questions in the sidebar, if, the, if you guys have seen any questions that you thought myself, Rochelle, or Marissa could answer. I don't know which one of our co-hosts is, looks like all of you are still. I saw an interesting question, can you hear me? Yes. Um, this one's, uh, I mainly for Marissa, but Rochelle too. Um, given that we are facing some new social distancing issues with the pandemic. Um, what are your thoughts on turning to online sales for um, the distribution of your different proteins? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. You know, on, online sales have, have been our platform from the get-go. Um, so we haven't had to, um, you know, alter our model too drastically with the exception of how we distribute our product. You know, typically we have customers come into the storefront to pick up their order. Now we're doing a no contact delivery option where they call or text the staff person who's who's there and then they come out with their mask and their gloves and they, they put it into the person's, you know, open, open car door. So that's been working for us lately. Rochelle, you could talk too about um, about your the, the way that you currently outside of the farmers market um, distribute product. Um, with Matsu Farm Club uh, turned into, I mean, started producing these butcher boxes, which um, encompass um, meat from producers around the state um, and the Matsu Valley, and um, the so we went from. Um, well, we've always been online. We just launched a website 
Um, and so that's made things much easier. But what I've been trying to um, do in the last week is partner with a veggie producer. And so um, we can move product together. Um, and um, I would encourage um, a lot of veggie producers to um, partner with their local meat producer and um, produce a boxed product that can be delivered or done in drop points. And we've always done the drop point system. We're year round. So adding this, um, a veggie producer, a CSA box, a veggie CSA box to that is very easy. And then um, it um, keeps their labor costs down. It keeps their time commitment down from the farmer's market. Um, and they can stay on the farm and do what they do best. And um, so it limits, limits exposure to the public. And um, we have, our, you know, started um, using masks and gloves and um, our, our system, our shop has always been, um, it hasn't been retail, so it's been close to the public. There's some things that we were already doing um, that really um, are beneficial in this COVID-19 world we live in now. So um, I would strongly encourage um, people to um, start thinking about plan B and um, partnering with people you don't, um, partnering with people that have products that you don't have. Um, because really the goal is to move food, Alaskan food to Alaskans. Um, and so, um, yeah, you got, we have to start thinking outside the box and partnering up and, and um, moving more food. It's funny how we've seen that, um, you know, in the kind of normal model, or some would say a normal transition of small farm production, uh, folks often start maybe with a CSA box, and then they transition to selling at the farmer's market and selling to restaurants and things like that. And I've seen a lot of announcements from farmers about bringing back their CSA box because of this COVID situation, maybe not attending farmer's markets and selling, you know, distributing through their CSA boxes this year instead. So I think, Rochelle, that's a great point that if, if a vegetable producer has a great CSA system involved, maybe if, you know, reach out to some of these meat producers, seafood producers. Um, if we get House and Senate Bill 16 passed, um, I, I suppose that wouldn't matter because you still have to have your herd share. Um, so never mind, but we, we still want to, we still want to get, I want to get Senate Bill 16 passed so bad because cheese is my love language and I want to be able to buy a herd share and eat it in cheese because I don't drink milk. But anyway, um, sorry to just run on about my own needs, but um, it'll be interesting to see um, new relationships developing and, and new people working together um, through this, through this COVID situation. I think there's nothing but opportunity there. I'm seeing Brad's question about what can markets that are not in Anchorage do to make it easier for meat producers to come to markets? Is it power? Is it having an indoor location? What would make it, what would make it appealing to you, Rochelle or Marissa, to, to get your product to a, a market outside of that Anchorage population? Power would be good. Um, someplace, uh, semi-permanent would be, you know, to be able to uh, buy those um, little glass, I guess they would be ice cream coolers or uh, freezers or, you know, and be able to plug them in. And um, one of my husband suggested, you know, um, we have these chest freezers. Well, we could just, pull, you know, put the chest freezers on the trailer and back the trailer up to the farmer's market and have the chest freezers. And so, um, yeah, having um, some way to keep that meat cool is, is even in a refrigerated situation, um, you know, they, I guess people could, if they had refrigerated trucks, could you share, um, you know, could a veggie producer share a space in a refrigerated truck with a meat producer? Um, because I don't know, I mean, I, I only know one meat producer with a, a, a freezer truck. I don't know anybody else with a freezer truck, but some of those collaborations um, would make it easier on the meat producer to be there, you know, um, 
having refrigerated space for the hours that um, they're at the market. Yep. Marissa, anything to add to that? Yeah, I would, I would echo, you know, certainly for the seafood sector, I would echo the importance of having um, freezer space. Uh, you know, one of the things that's kind of unique about selling on the peninsula, for example, is that there are a number of fishermen who harvest the same resource that subsistence and personal use fishermen can co go out and get locally. So maybe, you know, folks on the peninsula aren't necessarily as interested in salmon and there's a, you know, plentiful number of salmon fishermen who are here, but to have access to products that are caught maybe by fishermen in other communities, you know, who go off and catch, you know, halibut or rockfish or lingcod, um, who might not necessarily live in that community and have a freezer space of their own to store that product so that they can either, you know, sell that through another vendor or come occasionally. Um, just again, that, that um, community access to cold storage and freezer space, I think is, is important. Right. Um, Brad, I'm just curious, you as the Chanana Valley Farmers Market Manager, oldest farmers market in the state, um, do you guys, ha you guys don't have any meat meat sales at your market currently? I have a salmon uh, fisherman uh, that comes and I was just gonna put out a thing here. We'll come to the Fairbanks market. We have power and set locations. We don't have public cold storage, but if you brought your own freezer, we can figure out, we have had people doing this, bringing their freezers and storing them in the building or you can plug in. I really, really want to have meat at my market. I'm working on one vendor right now. I think we might this summer. We'll see. Yeah. Awesome. Well, two thumbs up. I think that for, you know, um, for all of us that are either farmers market managers, vendors, supporters, consumers, et cetera, um, we need to think of our industry as a whole, not just our little niche of the industry and the part that we represent, especially in times like these. We need to think about how can we support this whole industry? How can we raise Alaskans' awareness about the availability of Alaska grown foods, the safety, the quality, the access? Um, you know, it's been really interesting to watch what has happened to grocery store shelves um, over the last couple of weeks and what has happened to Alaska grown products and their availability. Um, suddenly, I can't get, you know, my, I don't drink milk, but my children do. And um, I only buy Alaska grown milk. And the store where I buy it has, there's all these complaints online. People are saying, well, Havemeisters must not be, you know, selling milk anymore. What's going on with Havemeisters? No, no, no. They're still producing just as much milk as normal, but now all these more people want it. And it's, so this, this COVID thing has driven people to local food, which is a good thing. And we hope all of you that can take advantage of it, right? Um, but we're, we're in it together. The, the very common theme of a rising tide floats all boats, right? So the more that we can support our neighbors who are producing different kinds of foods, different products, um, you know, I, I really strongly, I can't say this enough, but if flowers are going to be left out of farmers markets this year, that's a problem. Even if you're not a flower producer, that's a problem for our industry. We can't let any vendor be excluded from the farmers markets. We need them all there and we all need to, that's right, we all we're in this together. And so if you can all, you know, um, work with uh, Director Shady or whether we all need to talk to Lorinda about it or whatever we need to do to make sure that our flower producers can be in markets this summer, that's important. If you can send an email to um, Senate resources or to your representative or your legislator about Senate Bill 16. It doesn't matter if you're not a, a milk producer, or a cheese producer. We want access for our consumers and um, and we want to free the cheese for Amy because Amy wants cheese. But anyway, I think that I have used up my hour. Um, I don't know if there's any final questions over in there that people have seen or that they want to answer, but I'm not afraid to end a couple of minutes early. Can you have a comment? Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah. Um, Homer Farmers Market. So we have had um, a seafood vendor for probably over the last decade. And we get so many people coming to our market, especially um, a lot of the tourists looking for Alaska seafood um, that they can prepare for themselves. And we've also had um, Jackalof Bay Oyster Company um, for, oh gosh, probably eight years. And they serve to go and also oysters on the half shell and that's added a lot of diversity we also 
in the last few years have had a farm called Blood, Sweat, and Food, and they offer um, uh, chickens um, for purchase and rabbit right there. But they also offer, um, you can sign up for um, an animal share. So they, they sell pigs throughout the year too. So that's another, um, while you can't um, sell the process, you can sell a share of the pig. So that's another um, pretty awesome way to get more folks involved at the farmer's markets.